how is it even possible for you to have a three-year head start and still lose? Well, that's what happened to Lazada. In 2012, Lazada was launched with the intent to be the Amazon of Southeast Asia. But then Shopee launched in 2015, the underdog newcomer took the lead from them. I'll talk about C Limited, the mother company of Shopee, and how the two other companies under it, Garena and C Money, are crucial to each other's success. Garena, for instance, the gaming arm of C Limited, is the cash cow that made it possible for Shopee to give away all the free shipping vouchers and discounts that we've all been enjoying. And then there's C Money, the fintech arm of C Limited, responsible for payment methods such as Shopee Pay, S Pay Later, and C Bank. You may not have heard much about C Money, but it is slowly turning into a cash printing machine for C Limited. Shopee, Garena, and C Money make up the three headed dragon, which is C Limited. And that's what I'll be talking about today. My name is Chris. Welcome to Brand Origins. The man who started the entire C Limited empire was Forrest Lee. Forrest Lee was born in Tianjin, China. And fun fact, the reason why his name is Forrest Lee was because back in college when one of his professors asked them what American name they wanted to use, while most of his friends went with the name Michael Jordan, he chose Forrest from the movie Forrest Gump. He said that just like Forrest Gump, he was a bit shy and a bit of an outlier and so he felt that this name fit him well. He studied in a university in Shanghai and then took his MBA in Stanford. Stanford is where where he met his future wife, and it's a classic example of how sometimes everything just falls into place. Because Forrest Lee attended the graduation ceremony of his wife, and that ceremony would happen to be the one where Steve Jobs would give his now famous commencement speech. The one where he says, stay hungry, stay foolish. This speech made a huge impact on Forrest Lee, and he said that this is what gave him the courage to launch Garena. Garena was launched in 2009. It's a video game publishing and social platform. It's basically kinda like Steam, where as a User, you can get access to a large collection of games, conveniently download them, and be able to seamlessly interact and play with your friends. And as a game developer, by publishing your game on Garena, you basically get instant distribution to millions of gamers using Garena, mostly in the Southeast Asia region. It's a one-stop solution for game developers when launching their games in Southeast Asia. Garena started out as a publisher and social platform and eventually transitioned into developing their own games. One of their games was Free Fire and it became a huge hit. It was the most downloaded mobile game in the world in 2019 and 2020. By the second quarter of 2021, it reached a billion downloads on Google Play and was the highest grossing mobile game in Southeast Asia, Latin America, and India. It reached a record peak of 150 million daily active users. Now, Free Fire was a massive cash cow for Garena. Just to give you an idea, before Garena developed their own games, the way they earned money was by getting a cut from distributing games. So game developers would list their games on Garena, giving them instant distribution to the hundreds of millions of Garena users, and then Garena gets a cut, royalties that range from 20 to 35%. And what Garena does is that they secure these exclusive exclusive distribution rights for very popular games such as EA's FIFA Online and another one is Activision's Call of Duty Mobile and these are just two among so many others. Tencent acquired a 40% stake in Garena but would later on decrease this down to 18.7%. Garena would later on enter an exclusivity agreement with Tencent, one of the biggest companies in the world and an extremely dominant company in the gaming industry. They own Riot Games, the creator of the game League of Legends and 40% of Epic Games, the creators of Fortnite. They also have a stake in Assassin's Creed creators Ubisoft. Now this gives us a glimpse into how Tencent acquires companies. So what they would do is that they would first make a small investment in a company and now that they're an investor, this allows them access to financials, gives them a first-hand glimpse as to how the company makes decisions, gives them access to how the team navigates problems. Once they've discovered that the company is as good as they presumed it was, that's when they would decide to fully acquire the entire company. So yeah, getting distribution rights and publishing them on the platform, this gave Garena a consistent revenue but that's nothing to what you can get if you develop your own games. Forrest Lee understood that the future of gaming was in mobile, and so from being focused on the PC, Garena started to transition to mobile games, then started building their game development team. In 2017, they launched Free Fire, and it was a major hit. The best part about Free Fire is that since they're gonna be distributing the game on Garena, they don't have to pay royalties since it's their own platform. And one of the key reasons why Free Fire was such a success was because Garena understood the Southeast Asian market. Market. They knew that people here didn't have high-end phones. Garena was really in touch with the local gamers, and so this gave them the insight to design the game specifically for emerging markets. This understanding of the Southeast Asian market would help them again and again later on because this is one of the 
reasons why Shopee would leapfrog Lazada. Even though Garena is dominating Southeast Asia, in terms of dollar value, it's only doing around $4.5 billion out of the $220 billion market. That's because gamers from North America, Western Europe, and East Asia simply spend more. And even though Garena has developed several other games, none of them have really hit the heights of success that Free Fire has. But still, they're bringing in a lot of money and all of that would prove to be instrumental in the growth of Shopee. While Farsley and his team were running Garena, they started working on this chat app. They called it BTOK. So while running BTOK, they noticed that a lot of selling was happening on the chat app, like people were using it to sell stuff to each other. This gave them the crucial insight into the importance of C2C selling in Southeast Asia. And that one insight was one of the reasons why they shut down BTOK and led them to the launch of Shopee in 2015. Take note that around this time, even though there was yet to be a dominant e-commerce marketplace in Southeast Asia like Amazon is in the US, Shopee was already kinda late to the party. Lazada was launched in 2012, Indonesia e-commerce giant Tokopedia was launched in 2009, and Zalora in 2012. So yeah, they were kinda behind. But then Shopee had this blueprint, one that they would use over and over again as they entered new markets. The first important foundational piece that contributed to Shopee's success was to do a mobile-first approach, a big change compared to Lazada's move which was to be a desktop-first platform and gradually migrate to mobile over time. The reason why Shopee did this was because of the insights they got from Garena. They understood that Southeast Asia is a developing region, and data showed that emerging markets predominantly use their phones to access the internet. And so here's Shopee's blueprint when it's entering a new market. The first important factor is supply. Shopee's first goal is to attract local sellers. Having lots of local merchants mean cheaper products available for that country, which means more people will want to buy from Shopee. But of course, attracting local sellers take time. So initially, what happens is a lot of sellers in Shopee will be from China. For the initial supply, Shopee relies on cross-border merchants. So now, once people check out Shopee, they now have options. There's now a selection of products to buy. No local products yet, most are still from China, but that's fine. People can try out buying from Shopee. To get more people to the site, Shopee bombards the country with discounts, offering very generous vouchers, and this kickstarts the demand. As the demand starts to snowball, as more people get to know Shopee, and as more people start to trust it, local brands and entrepreneurs start to think, hmm, maybe I can sell my products on Shopee. To attract even more sellers, Shopee starts offering subsidized free shipping, which makes it so attractive to local sellers. More local sellers mean cheaper products, and cheaper products mean more customers, and more customers will attract even more local sellers. And as you can see, it starts to form this flywheel that fuels Shopee's growth. I assume that Shopee pretty much just started offering every single product they can find, but apparently, when they enter new markets, they deliberately first focus on products in the beauty, health, and fashion categories. Whereas Lazada initially focused on large ticket items, more expensive items, mostly gadgets, items that were pricier but ones that you wouldn't buy often meaning items that have a lower buying frequency rate, Shopee went the other way. Shopee decided to go for lower-priced fragmented categories just fashion and beauty. So why did they go for this strategy? Well, one reason was this gave first-time buyers a lot of items to choose from. These low-priced items allowed Shopee to build up a large assortment of items without having to take inventory risk. This gave people a wider variety of products to choose from. Considering that e-commerce is still pretty nascent in these emerging markets, since people were still just getting used to the idea of buying stuff online, cheap items made them more likely to start buying from Shopee. There's always resistance the first time you do something new, and buying lower priced items weakened this resistance. It encouraged people to be less concerned about fake products. And as they continued to buy from Shopee, they began to trust this site even more, and so they gradually start buying pricier items. Focusing on these categories also drew in young women, a demographic who tend to make more frequent purchases. Gadgets, on the other hand, tend to draw in more of the male demographic. One thing Shopee didn't expect but became one of the benefits of this strategy was that since Shopee started out selling cheaper items, Lazada underestimated Shopee. They felt that Shopee was more of a market for cheap items. And they assumed, oh, we're not competitors, we're in a different league. Little did they know that selling these cheap items increased buyer frequencies, eventually making customers more sticky to the platform. Unlike Lazada who invested a lot of money into building its logistics infrastructure, 
structure in Lazada Logistics, Shopee went the other way by partnering with third-party logistics companies. This greatly reduced the logistics costs of Shopee as it went for a growth-first strategy, allowing it to allocate this capital elsewhere. Both JNT and JNE grew alongside Shopee. And in one article, they said that whereas there used to be only a handful of JNT outlets in Indonesia, as Shopee and the e-commerce industry grew, there were now JNT outlets in every 5 kilometers. When Shopee entered Latin America, JNT expanded there as well to support the logistics needs of Shopee. Eventually, Shopee would start working on its own express delivery services in Shopee Express. This is still mostly present in Tier 1 cities and is pretty much just there to manage peak season demand. In this case, Lazada's investment in its own logistics network, sorting facilities, and warehouses, they've paid off greatly. Because today, Lazada is starting to be associated with fast and reliable deliveries. During the period when Shopee prioritized growth over everything else, Shopee was burning significant amounts of money, subsidizing free shipping, and offering very generous vouchers that could be stacked on top of each other. In the e-commerce game, what usually happens is that in the beginning, there will be several players. Over time, two players will take the lead, and eventually, one will pull away. And in the end, there will be one dominant player with an insurmountable lead and a far number two. The rest won't be threats anymore, and that's what happened in Amazon.com in the US, with Walmart being a far number two, Alibaba in China, and Mercado Libre in Latin America. So normally, people would be like, oh, it's okay if Shopee's losing money as it grows. I mean, when Amazon was growing, Jeff Bezos did tell investors that growth was the priority and that they just needed to wait for the right time to come. And when it does, they're gonna flick a switch and will start to turn a profit. The idea is that prioritize growth at all costs. When market share consolidates, pricing power follows. So normally, as the e-commerce race filters down most of the competitors, that's when the marketplace starts giving less and less vouchers and discounts. They start increasing commission rates that they get from sellers, and their advertising business where you can boost a listing so that you show up higher on Shopee's search results, that advertising business becomes more profitable. Shopee's hope is that these vouchers and discounts make people use Shopee long enough that they become top of mind and becomes their go-to online marketplace. And that eventually, even without the discounts, they hope that at that point, loyalty would have developed between Shopee and its customers. Shopee is able to continue funding the costs of these discounts and subsidies because of the capital they raised when Shopee's mother company, C Limited, went public in the US in 2017. And of course, there's Garena. As I mentioned earlier, Garena and the massive success of its hit game Free Fire was bringing in so much money. It was reportedly bringing roughly around $3 billion per year, which is then redeployed to offset the losses of Shopee and C Money and fund their growth. Unsurprisingly, since Garena is in the gaming industry, it has margins of up to 60%. Shopee isn't expected to be profitable anytime soon. And as for Garena, the concern is as to the longevity of their hit game Free Fire. You see, games have a lifespan. And although Garena has been working on developing new games, it's uncertain whether any of these games would be as big as Free Fire. Don't worry, I'll go into more detail later on about the risks and concerns about C Limited's future. Now, Shopee isn't the only thing Garena is funding though. This leads us to C Money, C Limited's fintech arm. C Limited got into the fintech business back when it was still Garena. Since Garena is a gaming platform where transactions happen since people get to buy games, in order to reduce friction and make payments more seamless, they launched AirPay in 2014. This allowed users to exchange cash for digital currency that is then used to make transactions on Garena. AirPay would later on be rebranded as Shopee Pay, but in certain markets where AirPay is already the recognized brand name, they kept it as is. Eventually, AirPay and Shopee Pay just became one of the many financial services under C Money. And now they have C Bank, their digital bank. They also have S Pay Later, their Buy Now Pay Later service where you can buy stuff from Shopee and pay in installments, and S Loans, their loans and financing offering. But then, why dive into fintech? Why can't they just focus on their two core businesses, Shopee and Garena? Well, there are two things, stickiness and synergy. If you're wondering why suddenly so many companies have their own mobile wallets and payment solutions, well, that's because having a payments network increases the stickiness of a customer, meaning they're more likely to stick around and continue 
continue buying from the brand. That's where the real value is of being into fintech. It locks customers into the ecosystem. So that's why you see Grab, which was primarily focused on ride hailing and food deliveries, out of nowhere, they launched GrabPay. Another reason why Shopee, Lazada, Grab, Gojek, Tokopedia, the reason why they're all diving into fintech and launching their own mobile wallets is because of the amount of data they have on consumers. These companies have already built huge audiences and customer bases in their own apps. So obviously, they've already accumulated so much data about these customers. This is a huge advantage because they can use this data to accurately assess their customers, which is extremely helpful, especially if you're offering loans and financing services. Banks and financial institutions are on a constant quest of finding out a better way of knowing who is worthy of a loan, how much to loan that person, and whether they can be paid back. They've been creating algorithms, making use of artificial intelligence, anything they can get their hands on to properly assess customers. But then, these huge companies such as Shopee, Lazada, and Grab already have this data, which gives them a huge advantage. So there's some level of natural synergy when these tech companies launch their fintech arms. Perhaps the best example is the synergy of C-Money with Shopee and Garena. So recently, C-Money launched their digital bank called C-Bank. Naturally, as part of the aggressive campaign to get more users, C-Bank at one point offered a 7% annual interest rate for those who open a savings account. That's now down to 5% but that's still pretty high compared to what traditional banks are doing. Even though that's pretty high, they have no problem sustaining this promo because of s -Pay Later and S-Loans. s -Pay Later is their Buy Now Pay Later product which allows users to make purchases on Shopee and pay via monthly installments. They reportedly generate around 18% annual interest and 30% annual interest from S-Loans, their financing business. And that's the beauty of C-Bank's business model. It's basically self-financing itself. It kind of turns into a flywheel. C-Bank's high interest savings accounts entices more people to open accounts, which means more capital that it can deploy on s -Pay Later and S-Loans. Through the high interest rates of s -Pay Later and S-Loans, they're already making money from this. But one more benefit is its effect on Shopee. The installment payment scheme of s -Pay Later makes more people want to buy more items on Shopee. The more people buy from Shopee, the more they trust it. Trust that Shopee leverages back to C-Bank. And so the flywheel continues to fuel its own momentum. The advantage of C-Money compared to the fintech arms of the likes of Grab and Goto, which is the merged company of Gojek and Tokopedia. Unlike Grab and Goto, which have yet to have profitable core businesses, which makes them more dependent on external funding. This means that C-Money doesn't have to worry too much about monetizing too early. It can just focus on growth. One of the key areas of growth that C-Money is focusing on is in its TPV, or total payment volume. A lot of C-Money's TPV is still from on-platform sources, meaning a lot of their transactions are still from Shopee and Garena. It hopes to increase its off-platform transactions coming from third-party merchants, which is why you're gradually seeing Shopee Pay go from only being usable on Shopee and Garena to being available for use in some stores and malls. In 2020, their off-platform TPV was around 10%, which is very low. Mercado Libre, their competitor in Latin America, had an off-platform mix of 60%. Even though it is still way behind its competitors, C-Money is expected to be able to hit positive cash flow in 2023 and be able to self-fund its growth. But competition is fierce, especially in Indonesia, perhaps the most important market in Southeast Asia. It's easier to understand C-Limited if we understand the landscape where C-Limited is present at. During Shopee's hypergrowth phase, its main region of focus, of course, was Southeast Asia. According to a study by Google, based on GMV or gross merchandise value or the total sales within a given period, Indonesia's GMV is 77 billion, followed by Thailand at 35 billion, Vietnam at 23 billion, Malaysia at 21, the Philippines at 20 billion, and Singapore at 18 billion. Based on this data alone, you can actually see how far behind the Philippines is because in terms of GMV, we're at fifth place. But then in terms of population size, we're second next to Indonesia. Accounting for 40% of the entire population of Southeast Asia, Indonesia is considered as the most important market in the region. They say that winning Indonesia means winning Southeast Asia. That's why Shopee first launched in Indonesia, and that's why Shopee has some services there that have yet to launch in the Philippines. Like in Indonesia, Shopee launched its taxi hailing service in December 2021 when they partnered up with Bluebird, the country's leading taxi operator. And with this, it goes head to head with Gojek and Grab. This move makes sense for Shopee because a ride hailing service integrates well with Shopee Food, its food delivery service. Shopee's entry into the food delivery game was actually pretty sneaky. So in 2019, 
2017, Sea Limited secretly acquired the Vietnam-based Now Food for $64 million. Now Food has been a strong contender in Vietnam, where at one point it had a 40% share of the market, making it a tight race against Grab. In 2021, Now Food rebranded to Shopee Food. In 2019, Shopee entered Brazil, marking its entry into Latin America. The reason why Shopee was pretty confident in entering LATAM was because of the insights they got from Garena. Since Garena also focuses on emerging markets, the success of Garena in LATAM gave them an understanding of the landscape, consumer profiles, and like what worked and what didn't work. And this is the synergy that I was talking about. You can see Shopee, Garena, and C-Money just working hand in hand. A year after, in 2020, Shopee became the most downloaded app in Brazil. But there is stiff competition in Latin America because of the incumbent e-commerce giant in the region. Mercado Libre. Mercado Libre has had a huge head start over Shopee. It's been around since 1999, is present in 18 countries, and is the clear number one in the region. But Shopee's opportunity is that there is yet to be a clear number two, and that's what it's gunning for. Brazil is Shopee's next biggest market, next to Indonesia. In 2021, they entered Mexico, Colombia, and Chile, followed by Argentina. Now, Shopee was pretty optimistic that it can execute the same strategy it used in Southeast Asia, especially since the blueprint works particularly well in emerging markets. But LATAM is actually even more behind than Southeast Asia, and it's even more fragmented. Mercado Libre has spent so many years building its logistics infrastructure, like it's come to a point that they're no longer dependent on state-owned postal services. Now what Shopee did was they used the same strategy they used in Southeast Asia, which was to partner up with third-party logistics companies such as JNT. But they soon discovered that the logistics costs are far more expensive in LATAM. That's why after only a couple of months, Shopee ended its local operations in Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Argentina, but users are still able to buy from Shopee via the cross-border model. Perhaps Shopee's most ambitious move was when it entered Europe. In 2021, it launched in Poland, Spain, and France. But unfortunately, it would exit from Spain and France just a couple of months later. Shopee used the same strategy as always, focusing on low-priced beauty and fashion products. Their goal was to get a foothold in the lowest end of the e-commerce market. So far, this strategy has been working well in Poland because apparently e-commerce penetration is still low there and Shopee strategy works well in these markets. Just to give you an idea, between 2019 and 2020, 67% of French residents have shopped online at least once. In Spain, it's 47%. Now compare that to Poland where only 8 out of 100 transactions were made online. Although it's doing better in Poland, it is still behind market leader Allegro. Now another reason why Shopee failed in Spain and France is that their flywheel had dead ends. Now remember that step one of the flywheel is to buy market share by subsidizing free shipping, using paid ads to draw customers, giving away free vouchers and discounts. But then unlike in Southeast Asia, the cost of doing all this is way more expensive. And let's say that Shopee does decide to push through and carry the cost of all these vouchers and discounts. Even if this leads them to build a big enough user base, the next step of the flywheel is to build trust. And that's where they encounter another dead end. And that's because it's trust is much more difficult to build in wealthier nations because their expectations are just way higher. So in France and Spain, they had a hard time building trust because they had this reputation of being the marketplace that sells cheap and low quality goods from China. And that's when they decided that's probably not worth it to push through. Now as bright as the future of Sea Limited is, if management doesn't mess up, there are still several risks. As I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons why Shopee was able to grow so fast and was able to sustain heavy losses as it bought market share with vouchers, discounts, and subsidized shipping, a big part of this was because of Garena, which was a cash printing machine, especially with its hit game Free Fire. Revenues from Garena also allowed C-Money to focus on growth instead of profitability. Gonna highlight the obvious and say that Shopee and C-Money's dependence on Garena is a weak point. Free Fire experienced a boom during the pandemic when people were stuck in their homes, but after the pandemic, it's been on the decline. Now, it's natural for games to have a life cycle. Apparently, only 40% of games sustain their popularity for more than four years, and Free Fire is already on its sixth year, which means that it's an outlier. But it's been on a decline, and it's pretty natural. That's just what happens to games. Garena has been doubling down on developing its own games in the hopes of following up on the success of Free Fire, but so far, none of them have been as successful. It is estimated that 60 to 70% of Garena's total earnings is from Free Fire, and that should tell you how important it is to Garena and how badly they need a new game to be as successful. Garena also has other concerns, such as the risk of Tencent not renewing their partnership for Garena to distribute Tencent's 
games. And recently, C Limited has been on the decline due to a couple of factors. One reason being that there's just been a slowdown in the global economy. It's not only C Limited stock price that's falling, majority of stocks are. I mean, even crypto. So yeah, less money in the public markets is a cause for concern. To add to that, Free Fire abruptly got banned in India. And the game was pretty popular in India, so that one was quite a huge blow to see limited. It was pretty abrupt, and it was mainly due to geopolitical tensions between India and China. And considering that Tencent, one of the biggest tech companies in China, owns a big part of Garena, they were concerned about national security since C Limited had Chinese roots. So yeah, this ban was a huge blow blow for Garena and C Limited. Because if Garena can't fund the growth of Shopee, then the runway for Shopee to become profitable, that runway shortens. It's not like they're gonna be dependent on Garena forever. Garena just has to fund them long enough until they become profitable. That's why, I don't know if you've noticed, but Shopee's vouchers have been becoming less and less generous. This is just one of Shopee's way of tightening its belt. They've now switched from a hyper growth strategy to taking steps to becoming profitable. Now the bright spot for Shopee is that all Although they are still operating at a loss, their loss per order has been decreasing. That's because as Shopee grows, it becomes more efficient with its logistics costs, it will be less reliant on expensive ad campaigns, and it can cut back on subsidized free shipping, vouchers, and discounts. I'm just discussing Shopee's path to profitability. One of the ways that Shopee earns is from seller commissions. Every time a sale is made, Shopee gets a cut or a percentage of the sale. To encourage more merchants into selling, usually they have this initial period where they charge zero commissions or very low rates. But recently, Shopee has been taking a bigger cut, and they will continue to increase this the bigger Shopee becomes. Another revenue stream that can boost Shopee's bottom line is in advertising. Sellers can pay to show up higher on Shopee's search results. The bigger Shopee becomes, the more valuable this audience becomes as well, which means that more brands will want to pay for ads, which means they're gonna be earning more from this advertising business. It's also looking pretty good for C-Money. Its self-financing model is on track for positive cash flow very soon. The only concern for C Limited is whether they have enough money in the bank to sustain operations as they wait for Shopee and C Money to become stable enough to self-fund their growth. So can C Limited make it through? We're gonna have to wait and see. And that's pretty much it. Now you know the brand origins of Shopee. I know I haven't mentioned Lazada as much in this video. That's because I have a more in-depth video covering the different strategies they took and the results of those decisions and how Shopee was able to overtake Lazada. So go check that one out. The links are in the description.